This special monthly UBU episode on hashtag Black Mental Health is sponsored by Janta Neuroscience and supported by the Painted Brain, a California peer-run organization. Okay, okay, so welcome and welcome back to Unapologetically Black Unicorns, and this is one of our special episodes, hashtag Black Mental Health. And so when I do these episodes, you know, well, when I do any of them, but we are really going to talk about our Black mental health today. And I have a wonderful, splendiferous, fantastic, exciting, you know, all the words I use, uh, guest today who's from right here in Los Angeles County, Yolo Akili. So Yolo, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. First of all, let me start by saying I love being called splendiferous. That is the most, that's one of the most amazing compliments I've ever had. So thank you for that. <laughs> I'm here, everyone. My name is Yolo Akili Robinson. Um, I'm the executive director and founder of BEAM, which is a Black emotional and mental health collective. BEAM is a national training, movement building, and grant making organization dedicated to the healing, wellness, and liberation of Black folks. Um, and I'm really excited to be here for the conversation. Awesome. I'm I'm just ready to dive in. So the work that you do, and let's particularly talk about California first. What does it look like? How, how do how do people even find you and find kind of a, a beam group? I, mean, I, I found it online. There was a lot of things that was going on on um, Twitter Spaces, for example. So how do people find you? And then what kind of things do you help them with? So first and foremost, BEAM is a training institution, right? The uh, principal part of our approach is that we just can't rely on social workers and therapists for our communities to heal. And the reality that the the vast majority of people who are first responders in Black communities are not social workers and therapists and psychiatrists, right? They are often teachers, religious leaders. They are um, pastors. They are barbers and stylists and coaches, big mamas and aunties and cousins. And so one of the things we recognize in our approach is that in order for our communities to really support, to support healing, we have to make sure that everyone in our village has a skills building, has more skills, more insight, more understanding, more reframing for how to understand mental health, how to respond to mental health distress, but also how to make choices every day that help prevent mental health crises from happening in their community wherever they are situated, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a barber, whether you're a stylist, et cetera, and also knowing how to get someone into broader psychological care if that's needed, right? And so our focus is really on what I call the everyday community folks, right? Because we really believe this approach that Western medicine has taught us that only only a select group of people should understand these concepts off in an ivory tower is not helpful when we need to actually build up a whole village to have some baseline understanding. We're not asking all of our people to be therapists, of course, Right. We're asking you to have a, a greater understanding of how you can do peer support and community care in a way that centers dignity. And so that's a big part of our work. And so most of the people who come to us, they come to us through a training. You know, mm-hmm. prior to the pandemic, we were all across the United States, here in Los Angeles, here in Oakland, Sacramento, many different places. Um, we were getting back and doing in person, but we also have been doing virtual, which has made our kind of um, much more accessible to a lot of folks. So we're really excited. So most people have an entryway through our training. We have um, a training called the Black Mental Health and Healing Justice Peer Support Program. And that is a training where you literally come in there where not only are we talking about practical skills, we're also exploring the real challenges that Black folks have in our communities from a racial justice, healing justice lens, which means we don't pretend that race and gender and sexual orientation don't also influence the nuances, that we don't pretend that like being an immigrant, if you're Jamaican, if you're Nigerian, doesn't differentiate the way in which you experience Blackness in the United States. We hold those nuances, give people skills and tools, Talk about the the history of racism to help people understand how racism and mental health historically and even present day have created the um, the space where we have so much mental health distress, right? And so that and that's really the focus of our program. And we do a lot of we do a lot of um how do I say embodied practices too. It's definitely an opportunity. A lot of people come to the train. They're like, I feel like it was a family reunion because we're going to throw some music in there. We're going to make sure we get in our bodies. We're going to make sure we mm. have a really kind of embodied experience that isn't just intellectual, right? And so um, that's the way a lot of people come to us through our training and education. Yeah. Another piece that I'll say is that um, sometimes people come to us from our big community events with, um, you know, sometimes we'll partner with celebrities to do these really kind of opportunities for bigger community conversations. 
We partnered with Jennifer Lewis and the California African American Museum of Art, right? Um, so those are just examples of also how people kind of engage us. We partnered with Second Home here in Los Angeles and had Miss Debbie Allen, who was amazing, come through and talk about dance as healing and mental health and wellness. So that's kind of a way people find us sometimes. That's really, that's so, I mean, there was just so much there. So I'm going to unpack a little bit of it because, and I think this is not something new, but something that we have to that you're doing is help people understand is that we have had these healing modalities all along. You know, when I go to get my hair done, you know, we're all sitting there and you're there forever and a day when you go into the beauty shop, you're not just going to get your hair done, right? You're going into community. You're going to talk about your problems that are having at home, that you're having at home. Miss Shirley sitting next to you can, you know, discipline your kid who's decided they're going to run out the door, do whatever, right? Because you're back there under the dryer. I mean, this is where our community is and this is where our healing happens because this is where we can share our stories and be authentically ourselves. So we've already had a lot of these modalities in church and home and all of these kind of things, uh, barbershops, salons and everything. So um, the idea of taking it and really, you know, turning it into something that can be intentional. So we're thinking about it intentionally and, you know, spreading it, I think is just so cool. When people go through these um, skill buildings and, and training, do you find that they're finding also their own healing as they're trying to work to be supportive and um, healers for others? Absolutely. With our model and our approach, which really um, situates from a concept called healing justice, We understand that like you cannot talk about healing and wellness if you're not addressing your own healing and wellness as well, that that needs to be a part of this approach, right? How you can support others is impacted how you're supporting yourself or how you are receiving support and allowing yourself to receive support. So there are many people who will come to our trainings. Um, You know, we just recently did a three-year evaluation where we hired an external evaluation firm to go back and talk to old participants from back to three years. And many people would say that it was in the training that they first realized that they had been living with anxiety their whole lives, right? Mm. Or they really came to the conclusion that like, maybe I'm living with depression or I've, I felt more comfortable being able to say, oh, maybe I can see a therapist, right? Because there's a lot of like education and reframing that we do in the training. Um, one of the pieces I think is really important in there, we talk a lot about therapy and we make sure people understand that therapy or any kind of healing practice, you are a co-healer in that practice, right? That Mm -hmm. means that you have agency. You can say, this does not feel good. This this is not what I would like to discuss and talk about. And for many of us, we have not been taught to engage the medical establishment, therapeutic establishments that way. We've been taught to believe them all powerful, all knowing, and to kind of hang our head down low. Mm -hmm. And so that reframe of saying, no, you can tell your therapist, hey, actually, that doesn't feel good. Yeah. It's actually about you still being an agent in that situation. You're still empowered to make decisions and choices to say also, hey, this medication you gave me, um, I don't feel like it. I don't like the way it's making me feel. Right. And so what are my other options? And I think that that's a lot. I know for my community and my family and my folks, that's not always how we start off with those relationships. No. If we no. go there. Yeah, I remember my first time, well, it wasn't my first time in therapy, it's not my third time in in therapy when I actually moved out here to California. And I was more intentional about, you know, going and trying to stick with it. And and, and first of all, I didn't understand the process. Like people, oh, go to therapy. It's talk therapy. You just talk. And I'm thinking the therapist is sitting in a chair. I'm sitting on a couch and we're just talking. And I'm supposed to like reveal my deepest, darkest, but this isn't how in my family we talk. This isn't where we talk and share our deepest, darkest. I'm like, can we have some chicken on the table? Can we have some potato chips? Can we like, you know, can we be in the kitchen? Like this is where we have our deep and deep conversations in our community and our connection. It isn't in this kind of weird sort of you sit in a chair and I sit on a couch. It's much more like that communal, we're sitting around the barbecue or it it was sort of this way of thinking how the relationship has to happen, the therapeutic relationship has to happen, but it didn't match culturally how we would have these kind of conversations. You're absolutely on point. And it doesn't fit culturally, right? So like the entire model and approach that's rooted in this kind of like passive observer, right? Like who's supposed to be observing, analyzing, assessing you, but who remains detached, doesn't disclose much about who they are. Like, you know what I mean? This is a very white approach to uh, anything, right? To wellness, mm-hmm. right? It's not rooted in Black culture where we're like, wait, tell me more about who you are. Wait, oh, I can't, you know, like those pieces are not yes. about that. 
So that's one dimension that we have to hold that like there are a lot of black people I know in our community with who will never engage that model because it's so deeply rooted in white supremacy and that it also triggers so much of the guilt and shame that people experience of being assessed and analyzed and pathologized through a white supremacist lens, right? And so that's one of the reasons I always tell people that like, as you just brilliantly said, a lot of times people will come to me and they'll like talk about, they need to talk about something difficult with the family member and they're not sure how to navigate it. And literally, I have about 100% success rate with this one, right? I tell them, I say, look, do you all have a meal or something that you all cook together? Is there a food that you enjoy? Is there something, do you all like, is it Popeye's? Is it y'all go to the pig? Mm-hmm. What is it? What is your food that you enjoy? And, and, and have a meal, make a meal together if you can. And then and then and then let the conversation come out as you check in. Right. And people always come back to me say, yeah, you know, it was it was rough at first, but you know, it was so smart because it's something that felt natural about us yes. just eating. It didn't feel right. fake and forced. And like, mm-hmm. and so even with big family, like, yeah, even with the family over, it just felt like, yeah, of course we're gonna talk about stuff and it's gonna come yeah. up. Yeah. That is more acculturated to us. It's also one of the reasons that BEAM is a peer support centered organization, right? We believe that community healing and community care is how we're going to transform ourselves. We're not going to one on one wait therapy our way out of this mental health crisis. It's just not going to happen like that. So, for example, um, we just recently um, did our community care and peer support grants, right? And so, what we did is we um, opened up application for three awards of $10,000 to go towards people who are doing healing circles, collective groups, circle spaces with Black folks around a lot of different issues. Here in Los Angeles, one of our grantees is Project Q. And Project Q is doing this amazing project where they are essentially creating a healing circle group led by therapists and wellness facilitators for Black parents of Black trans and queer children right? Parents who are maybe navigating their own kind of figuring out how to support their child, navigating what they've been taught and versus what they love their child. And and, and the intention of the group is like, how do we keep connection with Black parents and their children who are queer? Mm -hmm. And that's, and it's done in a circle space. It's done in a collective space. So not only are you processing your thing, but you're seeing that you're not alone in this journey that may be difficult. Right. That is, those are the practices that we want to support more of. It's one of the reasons we started that funding initiative, because we know that when we're in circles, we're in community and it's intentional community and directed, we have a, there's a different dimension of healing that can be possible. Yeah. Yeah. And so when you're when you were talking at the beginning, as well as giving this example around Project Q, so you talked um, about the racial and healing justice lens, but also understanding sort of that intersection of race and, you know, our queer community. So where are we with that other than they're poorly treated? (laughs) There's there's not enough. Like, so can you talk a little bit about how people find their healing in those intersections, if you will? Yeah. One of the things that was really important to me when I started Beam was to make sure that we didn't understand Blackness as monolith. And unfortunately, there are still moments when people will ask me, is Beam a gay organization or a Black organization? I'll be like, what does that mean? You know, Mm. we're still taught to think in these very binaries that are like not really reflective of the full spectrum of who we are. Right. And so what's really important in in all of our trainings, we lead um, in the beginning by saying that this is a space for all Black folks. This is a space for Black people who are Christian, who are Muslim, who are biracial. This is a space for Black folks who are Jamaican, who may be Nigerian, who identify as Black. This is a space for all of our experiences, disabled, queer, and trans, understanding that you might come into this space and have your idea of Blackness expanded or challenged, Mm -hmm. right? But we're trying to hold the nuances of how we all experience things differently based on where we're situated and where we come from in the in the African diaspora, right? So like really holding that nuance is important. I think that there's been some really pioneering and amazing work that's been done and being done in our communities around how we're talking about trans issues, how we're talking about queer folks in our communities. There's always always more work to be done. In our programs, like you know, we are really intentional. We have a Black Trans Women's Wellness Grants that we give out, right, specifically to Black trans women led mental health support services, right? So recognizing that Black trans women know their experience and know what they need with mental health and how they collaborate with therapists and wellness folks is different because they have a unique understanding of what the people, what their folks need. So thinking about it from that perspective is critical. Healing justice is, you know, a theoretical approach that says we cannot heal 
if we don't actually actively interrogate and challenge and end racism, sexism, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia. The Western model has often taught us that I can take you out of a community, pluck you and heal you, and then put you back in there, and that somehow that is going to be sufficient, right? When you're yes. whole- <laughs> I have to stop you. I have to stop because all of a sudden I went to church. I don't know quite what happened. <laughs> you know, my hands went up. I was like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, that's the Western model, whereas the village model and the peer support, the healing justice model says, actually, we need to support the entire community with skills. We need to support whole families and 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 and, and reach. And not only that, for supporting folks, we actually have to dismantle the system that create the conditions for the distress in the first place. Right. We can't talk about the increased suicidality, the increased depression and anxiety in black communities and not talk about racism and not talking about economic exploitation, not talking about access to clean water and the ways in which Black trans women are attacked and killed. Like we, we have to think about all those things are compounding to create the experience of distress that Black folks have. So when I tell people, like, you know, one of the things that um, I've had to struggle with as an executive director with some of our interventions is that people have been like, oh, that's not mental health. And I've had to be like, that is mental health. So for example, we have our Black Parent Support Fund. It is exactly what it sounds like. It gives economic support to Black parents who are living with mental conditions are supporting people who are living with mental conditions, right? And so the intention of that is to support, because we know when you're living with depression, it's different when you're living with depression and no lights and you got kids. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that people have to like be like, well, how was that mental health? I was like, well, if you don't understand how economic support is mental health, I'm really curious about what you, you, you do. Are you just assuming it's just a DSM and therapy? Do you not understand? And we get to so much feedback from parents who are just like, I was able to pay my car note. Thank you, Jesus. I was able to get groceries and I was able to breathe and even be better for my kids because I had that space now because of this payment, this the support. So we have to really kind of expand what people are thinking about and understand the conditions and systems create distress. It's not something that pops up by the blue. Yes. The reason I got so excited and had that hand raised moment literally was because I have always said you cannot medicate away racism. Mm. So I can go into therapy, I can go into treatment, and and I'm not saying anything negative about medication and it's how it can be sometimes supportive for people. I'm not, I'm not saying that, right? At the same time, we're still surrounded by the things that may be causing us to need medication and or extensive therapy sort of in this more medicalized um, approach. So I couldn't agree more about we also have to dismantle the things that are causing the root cause of the mental distress that cause mental ill health. So you just broke that down. That's why I was like, yay, yay. <laughs> like really having a moment because I think that it can elude people and then they get disillusioned about, but why don't I feel better? I you know, was also thinking a little bit about what you were saying about supporting the parents or, or supporting somebody who has a um, you know, mental health condition with this economic support to to Black parents and trying to remove a stressor for them. And so do you all also talk about like social determinants of health? Because that feels like one of those social determinants of mental health where it's it's not a foreign concept. It's not unconnected. Yeah, I often call them structural determinants of mental health, right? Like this is yes. like structural, it's policy, it's agenda. It's, it's, right. it's intentional, like people are intentionally underpaid in this country, right? Like, you know what I mean? And corporations know they are paying poverty level wages for folks. And therefore, so like, you know, it's definitely a structural determinant. Um, and so we do talk about that. That's one of the reasons that we have that fund, because we understand that this is the all part of 360 of supporting people around mental health. One piece I would love to kind of circle back to you lifted up is talking about medication, you know, mm -hmm. black folks, understandably, have always been, you know, somewhat hesitant collectively of the medical industrial complex and continue to be. And I think that hesitancy is adaptive. It is uh, it is, comes out of an hist ongoing history, not even like so it's not stopped of harm within medical institutions and psychiatry is not exempt from that by any stretch of the imagination. Um, when we look at medications and, you know, there's all the kind of conversation currently about antidepressants and, like, and their usefulness versus placebos and like talking about antipsychotics and how they can actually be really dangerous after prolonged use of multi-years, right? Mm -hmm. So we have this moment where we have to really kind of um, hold this, this one piece that pharmaceutical companies have not had always the interest of Black people in mind, let's be honest, and also hold that 
there is a there is a way that medication, when monitored appropriately, when used appropriately, can be helpful for people in their wellness journey. But how that looks may not be long term. It may not be maybe short term. Right. And, and and how it also may needs to, needs to be in conjunction with other kind of wellness practices. Um, some of the rise we see in people using very variety of different mental health medications, people would often argue and say is because we want the quick fix, right? We want the quick fix and not the systemic and the structural and the community and the emotional and the behavioral which takes a lot more time and engagement. And so I think it's important for this conversation that we hold, yes, we need to be skeptical and curious about some of the choices that pharma, what's pharma's pushing, pharma's relationship to the diagnostic statistical manual historically and diagnostic inflation, the ways in which some of these categories have changed over the course of the last couple of, last decade, couple of decades. We need to be curious about that and thoughtful. And we also need to acknowledge and hold that some of us will need to engage in medication with effective monitoring, with other interventions to support ourselves. And that's okay. Yes. And I think as you're talking about this, one of the things that, you know, I had to learn over time too, is that I needed information in order to make choices about these things. So that instead of just, you know, giving me a prescription, like the doctor can whip out the prescription pad, write the prescription, give it to me and I go fill it. I need to understand exactly what what is this and what you know what is it for and how will it help me and how do I um talk to you about if it isn't helping me or if I have side effects that I don't read about or that we didn't talk about and and how long do I need to be on it and well what happens if I would like to come off of it and and what other things can we try and you know really person centered care that autonomy that you were talking about you can't have that autonomy if you're not Number one, if you're not given the information, you're not making an informed choice. You might be making a choice, but it certainly isn't informed. And I was really lucky that, um, you know, in, in sort of my mental health journey, which I talk openly about, of course, it's like medication. Oh, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. No, 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 thank you. Um, and, and I'm, you know, lucky that my um, psychiatrist is like, okay, well, you know, let's let's see how this kind of goes. And, oh, I'll never forget. He, he said, here are a few that I want you to think about. So he gave me all these... Um, documents to read. And I got to go home and read the documents. And I came back and had all these questions. And the first thing I looked for actually in the studies was how many Black people were in the study. That's the first thing I looked for. And if I didn't see, you know, enough or a significant number, that was my first question because I was worried about maybe how the medication might metabolize or how the side effects might be different. And not that I know science in that way, but it started me asking these questions and it made my psychiatrist much more amenable to thinking about how I was thinking about the medication, the information I needed to know, and how he was giving me that information. So I did find something. I was Dr. Google or WebMD. I don't know where I was. I found a, um, a, a natural, it was kind of sort of this natural thing that you could use like, like a vitamin that they were actually using a lot in Australia and New Zealand for anxiety. And um, or for OCD, I have a, I had very very severe OCD, and nothing seemed to touch the OCD. And I found that they were using this particular thing in Australia and New Zealand, but I'd never heard of it being used here. You can access it here, but we just don't use it for anxiety or OCD. And so I showed my doctor the research paper, and he's like, "This is really interesting. Let me call the people in the research paper and let's figure out what we could do." And I was like, "You're gonna call Australia." And talk to some people about how to figure out the dosages so that we could. And he he did that. And I thought, this is how I was able to not just be engaged in treatment, but I was activated in treatment and I was a co-partner yes. with the provider. So I think you're right. We don't talk about this enough. It's like, here's the medication, go take it. And by the way, you're going to be on it the rest of your life. And that's not really exactly how it works. You can have conversation. You can make joint decisions, shared decisions. And I, I'm so, well, first of all, that's such a beautiful and powerful example. Like I just have like so much like um, respect for you for like pioneering that and doing that work. One piece I'm also thinking about, and I'm, I'm like, you know, you had, you were in a point in your journey where you were functioning well enough to kind of communicate those things and do that research right mm -hmm. and unfortunately a lot of our folks are not and then mm -hmm. if they have a practitioner that has that diligence who has that thoughtfulness who understands that okay this medication has symptoms but how the symptoms how how the how the uh, side effects of these of these um medications influence this person as a black person moving to the world because that's mm -hmm. a whole different dimension too right like you know thinking about yeah. well hold on 
What does it look like when it shows up for you and how and how might this create other variety forms of distress? Right. And even the intentionality, like, you know, I know some really great psychiatrists who've been thoughtful about let's also get you talking to an herbalist or nutritionist. Let's mm -hmm. talk about like, how, like a wraparound approach. But yes. we know that's not common. Right. That is not the standard. Exactly. practice, And then most of our folks, when they are getting the medicine, they just kind of want a quick fix to feel better. You know what I mean? And there's not these robust dignity center conversation that you're having. And that's what we need to get to what you and e even I would say, even though we get to, but like also that um, I would say that like there was an opportunity even for your practitioner to dig deeper. Right. Like, it, was there yeah. space that you didn't have to hold all that? Why did you have to go digging? You know, so there's yeah. still opportunities and growth for psychiatry, for mental health practitioners around how we do care or how folks do care. Are, are your trainings also open to practitioners or do you have specific trainings that are for, you know, licensed practitioners? So they're getting this rich information as well. I will tell you, we have so many, the, the type of people who come to our trainings, many practitioners, many social workers, many therapists, we have activists from like different movements who come through. We have had people who um, work in county and state and behavioral health, health hospitals. We have had um, just parents come through. So it's very, it's very designed. We designed it with the intention of if you work in Black communities and you live in Black communities, that you can have an entry point to take these tools and adapt them to your space, wherever you are at, right? So even whether, whether you're working a nonprofit or you're a nurse, there's an opportunity for that reframing and tools. So yes, so the short, short answer is yes, we do get a lot of clinicians and social workers. We also we often get people asking us to um, do CEU courses. And the only reason we've been kind of, we've been a little bit reticent or a little bit selective about doing that is because then it becomes just all about the social workers and not about the community, which is what we're trying to right. stay at. Right. And I was, we're like, we actually, if we get, we make it all see you, y'all going to just take over and then it's going to be all social. Like, no, that's great. But we need to also be focusing on the folks on the ground. Right. So um, I'm going to go back to one thing. And 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 that is something that happened, um, you know, here in California and was of concern to the, particularly to the transgender community or people who are, were in the process, are in the process of transitioning. And that's if they um, end up in a situation where they're referred to courts or any other type of involuntary care, that they may be forced medications that are contraindicated to the transitioning um, and, and hormone medications that they're taking. So again, there's that intersection. And, um, you know, these may be folks that you're saying, they may not have the um, ability because of where they are in their wellness journey to advocate for themselves or have these conversations or even ask these questions. So how are they themselves trained to be their self-advocate, their own advocate? And how are other people who are their supporters trained around some of these issues too? So in our, in our trainings, there is a lot of education around self-advocacy. And the conversation we just had is really kind of through storytelling. We kind of like talk about these principles of like, how do we actually advocate for ourselves and understand that we have an agency and role, right? But also the, an important part of this too is also thinking about how we can be as uh, folks who may not be directly impacted, how we show up for our friends, our loved ones, and family members, right? So I often tell the story of like, I will, I will, I will go to the therapy office with my friend and sit outside because she just needs that assurance that someone's there with her. Like, you know what I mean? Or like sometimes, like we're getting, we need to be um, being called into the room to be like, hey, my brother wants to come in here, or my sister wants. And, and being able to support our family member who might not be in the place where they can really say those things, but mm -hmm. need that advocacy with their consent, right? Mm -hmm. And so thinking about what that looks like and balancing that out is really, really important. When it comes to the court systems, when it comes to supporting trans folks, Black trans folks, even as you were sharing that example, which is very common, we have just such an exorbitant amount of work to do to really protect the wellness of trans folks. And we know trans folks, uh, Black trans folks particularly, are resisting in a number of ways when they are receiving those kind of like orders, like whether it's like not taking the medication, whether it's doing different things. But we unfortunately have a very hostile, you know, court system and medical system to trans folks, particularly in this political moment. And so I think it's important, and this is something I've raised with some of my other colleagues um, who are doing Black wellness and mental health work, is that we need to make sure that we understand that Right now, where they're talking about these bills against trans and queer kids and trans folks, they're talking often around the, the conversation as if they're just white. But we know when Black trans and queer folks are in there, they're getting hell on, on a whole different level. Mm -hmm. that, that the attacks, that the discrimination, that the derision is happening on a whole different dimension that maybe these white-led you know, trans and queer organizations are not even touching or addressing because they know our faces don't invoke empathy 
in the same way that those white faces do in the general populace, which is a whole mm -hmm. another Pandora's box to open up, right? So just naming those pieces. Right, right. Okay, that's that's super helpful to, you know, for us to double down to think about what more do we need to be doing and how can we be doing that? I think that's critically important. And um, you know, I was just thinking too, when you were saying that uh there's also, you know, the self-advocacy as well as the friends, the family members, and other folks who might um support a person. I was thinking about um my chat with the Trevor Project. I didn't talk with the Trevor Project, I talked with Preston at the Trevor Project. And it, it just struck me how he was saying the power of what one adult can make, that if there's mm -hmm. just that one adult, particularly for LGBTQ folks, what a difference it can make in people's lives. And so this is such a great example of not only can you make a difference, but we can help you make that difference because we're giving yes. you that training that you need. So I'm going to ask you one other question, which is before we even get to where we're going to get next. How did you even get into this work? Before you before I go to that question, I just want to name that um so much love. I actually just recently connected with Maisha from the Trevor Project, who's actually the researcher who actually helped cultivate that amazing research, an amazing Black woman. So I just want to name that as well. All right. How did I get to this point? I grew up in communities like many of us where people were suffering and navigating a lot of distress and didn't have tools to navigate that distress or to process that distress um, in ways that were really center dignity, that center safety, and that helped cultivate wellness. That just wasn't something that a lot of folks in my communities and families had, right? And so mm -hmm. I saw it growing up. I saw the consequences of it. I lived the consequences of it. And as I got the opportunity through, due to the sacrifices my parents and my family made to be able to go to college, to be able to study and learn, I learned there were different ways of showing up in the world and that mostly these tools, these opportunities to for healing and engagement have been really kind of neglected and not really exposed and shared with my community. That like, it was just, it was, they, they were alien, whether it was how we reframing emotions, reframing how we think about the body, all of that was just alien to the communities and families that I was a part of, right? And so I really became committed to, after like 20 plus years in wellness work, you know, working with men who had anger management issues, working with people who were living with HIV, working with people who were survivors of sexual violence, I always knew that I wanted to create an institution that I feel like I could fill the gaps the, the modern psychological mental health establishment just didn't seem to be caring about for us, right? And mm -hmm. so that was really kind of what led me to make, to really kind of co-create or co-create, make Beam, because I feel like even though I initiated Beam, it is a collective project, right? Like, I, I think that's so important as a founder to say that, like, I feel very called by ancestors to initiate this. Mm -hmm. I feel like those same ancestors, ancestors were like, let me bring some people in to help you because you ain't, you can't do this yourself. It's a collective <laughs> mm -hmm. project, right? Mm -hmm. It is something that we all own and we all we all usher in and, and cultivate, cultivate and correct and create, excuse me. So, so yeah, so that's kind of like the short version. And my, my hope for Beam, um, my vision for Beam is that it continues to be that space that loves on us celebrates us, supports us, honors our legacy of healing. Mm -hmm. The conversation on like Black people don't talk about race, about mental health, which is so deeply racist, right? It's like mm -hmm. Black people don't use the language that white folks and white institutions use around mental health commonly. Most communities of color do not. But we talk about mental health. We might say so-and-so is touched or they got the blues or, you know, it's my nerves. We don't say anxiety. We might say my nerves. We're having conversations and I've always been having conversations about mental health. We have just been saying it in ways in which white institutions have not validated, honored, or respected. Just like they have not respected our wellness and our healing interventions as valid. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's so important to honor, like when we, in our, for being, to honor our legacy of healing. We have all prayer circles to, to like, to, to, to church, to singing and song, to, to the tarot lady that's in every hood, to the like herbalist, to gardens, to all these pieces. We have had strategies. Yes. We always have had strategies. And it doesn't mean that our strategies don't need to be refined. They need to be sharpened, maybe modified. But we've had strategies, right? So I think it's important we start there because what the what what racist and mental health institutions would like us to believe is that they're coming in to teach us something we didn't pioneer and we haven't been doing for generations. Yes, thank you. Snaps, claps, thumbs up. 
I don't even, I, I need another something, but <laughs> it's just like, you know, this is amazing, amazing wisdom. And like I tell, you know, all of my guests that like throughout our conversations, just dropping, as I say, mad wisdom throughout, but as we wrap up, as I know you're, you've got time, I got time, but as we, as we wrap up, what may be one piece of wisdom that you want to leave our audience with like that golden nugget. And I know there's no such thing as a golden nugget because it's all gold, <laughs> but yeah. What's that one piece of wisdom you want to leave our audience with? We will not one-on-one therapy our way out of this mental health crisis. Therapy is a wonderful intervention with its own limitations. And every tool has its limitations. Yeah. Laying hands has its limitations. Medication has limitations. We need a variety of different tools. And one of the tools that we need to continually cultivate more is community circles, healing circles, and groups and spaces for us to process collectively with intention and led by skilled folks who can help us hold and see and valid- be validated through each other's experiences and practice new skills and behaviors together. We need more collective and community care. And so Whatever practices that you are engaging in, I want to invite you to think about how I could be doing this in community and how that might challenge me and how that might grow me and how that might help me learn um, how to show up and transform not just myself, but also community level patterns and a generational level patterns that there's the opportunity there. Amazing, amazing and amazing work. And thank you, Yolo, for all that you do and, you know, creating these loving and safe spaces for our communities and giving us all of this wonderful wisdom to move forward. So thank you so much for joining me on Unapologetically Black Unicorns. Thank you so much for having me. All right, folks, you heard it. It is the wrap of another hashtag Black Mental Health special episode. And that means that we will see you again next month. But do not forget to like, share, subscribe. But most importantly, I need you to share and share with folks who need to hear this information. So thanks so much. And that's a wrap. Thanks.